Welcome back, everybody. Um, for the panel coding confessions, uh, led by Colin Soze, and I'll directly hand over. Thank you. So just to set the scene a bit here, this is um, Coding Confessions. This is an idea that came out of the collaborations workshop back in 2021 from a group of us who were thinking about how we could make it a bit more acceptable for RSCs to talk about when things had gone wrong and what they did to correct those things and how we can stop other people repeating those mistakes. And that we kind of view this as a way of... Um, you know, not having a culture of blame and trying to improve people's mental health a bit, that they don't get too hung up on making mistakes that maybe they want to hide, and that perhaps other people have made similar mistakes, but they don't want to tell other people about it and just making it a bit more acceptable for us all to talk about them. So we have here our panel who have all volunteered to tell us about one coding mistake that they have made at some point in their career, um, possibly a long time ago in a previous job that they won't get too much blame for. <laughs> um, so they're each going to tell us about what it was that they did, um, what impact it had, how they mitigated it, hopefully, and what other people could do to prevent it. Now, we're also wondering, we originally thought we had only 25 minutes for this panel, and it turns out we've actually got longer. So if there are any audience members who'd also like to come up and give their confession at the end, <laughs> after the panel have finished, if you would like to come up, we would be more than welcome to hear your confessions too. If, however, you're not so willing to do this in public, in front of an audience, especially at such short notice, we do have a Coding Confessions website on which you will find a Google form, and there you can submit your Coding Confessions anonymously, and we will also publish these on the website. And the website's now been going a few years. This is the third time we've done this. So we do have a growing collection of confessions now that have appeared on the website. That might be an interesting read for anybody who um, finds this panel interesting. So I'll now introduce my panel members. So if I get each of them just to say who they are and where they're from, and then we will do the confessions after that. So. Okay, uh, I am Fliss Guest. I am a senior RSC at the University of Exeter. Hi, I'm Phil Harrison. I'm the RSE team lead at the University of York. Hi, I'm Samantha Finnegan. I'm a senior RSC in ARC at the University of Durham. And do we have our online participant? <laughs> Yes, okay. hi, can you hear me? Just hold on for them, then maybe they can introduce themselves as well. Yes. Also, quickly, I will also plug that Dave, who was one of the creators of Coding Confessions, who is sat here at the front, <laughs> has also done a lot of work on mental health for RSCs, and he has set up a mental health mailing list. So if this is a, a wider topic that interests you, then please go and Google, I think, RSE mental health mailing list, and you should be able to find um, that. Yeah. Hi, my name is Lieke de Boer. I'm a community manager at the Netherlands eScience Centre. Right, thank you. So we now have our panel introduced, so now we will take it in turns if we work along the table and then if we do you last, Lika, if that's all right, um, to do your confessions. And we'll give you each approximately five minutes to do that. So Fliss, if you'd like to go first. All right, why did I say I'd go first? Um, <laughs> okay, so um, a couple of years ago, I was working on some astrophysical simulation code um, and my job was to essentially extend this code and, and integrate some other code into it as well. Um, so you couldn't install or run this code on Windows. I was using a Windows machine at the time, so I decided to set up a virtual machine. Um, I'd never used a virtual machine before. Interesting experience. Um, so I provisioned it. I started to install this code and I came across an error. Uh, so I scratched my head for a while, did some Googling. Um, the error message was not helpful in any way. Please write better error messages. Um, so I thought, well, I'll tear it down and, and start again. I must have done something wrong during installation. Um, about nine or ten tries later, still the same error, no progress. Uh, and I decided to buddy up with someone and do some pair bug fixing, is that a thing? Um, a few hours later, we figured out that I hadn't given the virtual machine enough memory. So the package didn't have enough to, to download before it could install. Um, and once I'd given it enough memory, it worked fine. Um, <laughs> so the moral of that story is uh, make sure you give the virtual machine more memory than you think it needs but also buddy up with someone else a bit earlier. Don't spend 
a day on your own, scratching your head, thinking that you've done something wrong in the, in the installation process. It's, it's maybe an issue further back down the line. Um, so yeah, that's my confession. Right, thank you. <laughs> so my confession relates back to um, my PhD and this particular bit was probably about 15 years ago now so I think far enough away mm. in, the, <laughs> in the past to not be of too much concern so my PhD topic was looking at measurement errors specifically within speech signals and a particular speech feature which are known as formants and these are effectively resonances in the vocal tract which give vowels their particular sound so they're useful to measure you can work out what vowels someone's saying and they're also kind of a bit idiosyncratic so useful to help identify people who are who are speaking one of the kind of annoying things is that they're quite difficult to measure directly the speech spectrum is a bit sparse and we're looking for general trends in the the shape of the the spectrum so you can't really get a nice ground truth measurement to test different algorithms different settings different approaches so one thing that i did was to use synthetic speech great we can specify what these formant values are in the synthesis process know what the ground truth is we're in a stack of measurements and then we can actually know kind of for real what our measurement error is so this was the first time i'd done anything with synthetic speech i was using a bit of speech software called pratt that's quite esoteric idiosyncratic but it's used kind of hugely in the linguistics and speech fields and I was very happy that I could do my synthesis and my measurement in the same bit of software. I didn't have to export tons and tons of sound clips. So this is all good. There was even a nice, some example bits of code that I could take out the manual and run that. Great. Happy got my synthesis. Hours and hours of leaving my computer chugging away, getting lots of numbers out then lots of analysis as well. I even got some nice 3D animations, which some of my colleagues called flying carpets, <laughs> like nice wavy, hideous color schemes in MATLAB and was all happy. And because I was doing this part time, this was maybe about a year's worth of work. So I come to think, oh, right, great, done all that analysis. I probably better write it up before I forget everything that I've done. So I get to the speech synthesis part, and this is where the memory's fading, and I can't quite remember what it was, but for some reason I was like, I need to go back and check my code and make sure that I actually did the right bit of this synthesis properly. And this is where the issue turned out. I hadn't done it properly. So with speech, there's a general acceptance that the, the frequency spectrum has got a bit of a slope to it. It tails off at six decibels for every octave or doubling of frequency and i decided i was going to use a different kind of source model so speech is a source here at the larynx and then the vocal tract is a filter on top of that and i'd gone for a really really simplistic source model which had a flat frequency spectrum the example in the manual had accounted for the fact that it needed to have the slope and that was the crucial bit that i'd missed out so my first thing was can I get away with this? <laughs> Can I find something in the literature which says, oh, actually, no, it's fine. Some people do have speech that doesn't have this nice roll off. And then I was, no, can't get around it that way. Then I was like, oh, well, I should probably check them and see, actually, does it have an influence on the measurements? So I just ran one set of results and it did. And I was like, I know all this now and I'm a good, honest, responsible scientist. And so, the only thing that I could do was then redo effectively a kind of year's worth of, of work. But thankfully, it was all coded. I was very happy that I'd managed to do my whole PhD without having to manually measure one of these form things because phoneticians spend their lives manually measuring these things and I could do it all automatically. So kind of the get out was I had the code that I could rerun, thankfully, but that was still quite a lot of work to to do that so i guess my sort of takeaway from it would be and again i don't know quite why i missed it whether i was being like too excited to get onto the next bit of the analysis that i hadn't spent enough time focusing on 
make sure I get this kind of, it's like it's a really well-known model within speech. It's not kind of just something weird. I should have paid more attention. I think I must have listened to the output and just gone, oh yeah, that sounds all right, but actually probably should have done some more detailed analysis of the signal, looked at the actual spectra of the different parts, even just the final bit of speech. I guess if I'd had, like you said, someone to work with, someone to look over the code, hopefully somebody would have spotted it. Um, and I guess probably the other thing, which I'm still probably guilty of to some extent now, is thinking, oh, well, if the code runs, then it's probably doing the right thing. And I think that was probably my worst assumption. And I did look back at the manual and the actual examples they give, it, it does actually account for this and it says it very clearly. So it was my decision to like divert from what was in the manual. So I guess that's the other thing as well, if you're going to adjust examples or do things a bit differently, make sure that what you're actually doing is either very similar to the example or what you've changed doesn't then actually introduce something new completely. And I have used this example before as well with kind of supervising masters and PhD students to kind of yeah normalize this issue of it's fine to make mistakes, even me sitting here trying to supervise you and help you with your research i made a massive cock up so don't worry if you do like the same thing it's perfectly normal <laughs> so thank you that's me thank you okay um so i have what i think it's probably essentially a, a, a short and sweet little story uh, about a decade ago, just over a decade ago, I worked for a, uh, a large multinational uh, corporation. Uh, let's call them uh, multinational business computers. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in, in the course of my internship there, um, I was put in charge of test infrastructure for their implementation of uh, the Java virtual machine which they use to um, underpin all of their corporate products that they develop across the board or did at the time. I don't know if they still do. Um, and I'd like to think that as an intern there, I, I helped them to develop their uh, authentication and security procedures uh, and uh, their uh, um, backup. I helped them to test their backup procedures, <laughs> uh, although perhaps not intentionally. Um, so, like I said, I was put in charge of, of test infrastructure and I was given a, a couple of servers to, um, which had access to a whole range of different servers with a, various different configurations of operating system, uh, RAM, disk size, all of the rest of it, because we wanted to test this, this thing on as many different, um, configurations as possible. And, um, so I, I sort of started building uh, this this system, which would kick off automated tests. Um, uh, so it would it would set up a test environment on these machines. It would um, uh, get all of the um, files that it required from the build server um, and and other test files. It would pull those over the network, put them in a folder, um, run the tests, and then when it was would, was done, it would clear up after itself. Sounds like a perfectly sensible script. Colin, could you drag my perfectly sensible script onto the screen, please? <laughs> um, where's it gone? Is that? It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it looks something like that. <laughs> um, which, you know, if you, if you give it a, um, if you give your bash script a, a parameter for your test environment, and then it, it runs through and it does, and then it cleans up after itself. And um, and I ran this server, um, this script on a server which, for some reason, they gave me root on. <laughs> um, I can't think why. Uh, and and that server also had NFS mounts onto the build servers. Um, like I said, I helped them test their backup procedures. <laughs> um, so, so my boss at the time was not particularly happy, but I was an intern. They'd given me far more permissions than they should have. It was their fault. Um, well, so what could you do? What could you do to to not to not do this? Well, don't use RMRF uh, like that. It could be it could be a good one. Um, you could use uh, set dash u at the beginning of your bash script to to 
check for undefined variables. But even that, if you if you if that variable is initialized to uh, an empty string, that would still happily run. Um, or, or perhaps maybe just don't give your intern root on your um, test server. Mm. There we are. That's my story. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that. And finally now, can we have Lika? Hi. Yeah, thank you for inviting me to this. Um, uh, my story is also from during my PhD. It's kind of two stories that are connected. And the first one is the reason that I started coding in the first place. So it's not a coding confessional, but more of a um, SPSS click mistake confessional. Um, and during this time, I'm just telling the story because I think the way that my supervisor responded to is is responded to it is kind of exemplary in how you should respond to it. Um, I did analysis on some data on um, uh, behavior and brain data from older and younger adults. So we tried to find out differences between how young and old adults behaved and how their brains also responded differently to certain stimuli. And I was very excited about this and um, tried to work uh, really hard on it, but also didn't know anything about coding. I hadn't learned any of it during my master's or or bachelor's um, and um, just kind of worked the way I thought would be best, uh, which included sometimes copy pasting data from one spreadsheet into another uh, by hand. Um, and at some point that meant that I copy pasted some data, um, one row offset from one spreadsheet to another, which created the absolute most beautiful correlation I'd ever seen uh, between some uh, age variable and uh, a brain signal that e exactly lined up with our hypotheses and was very uh, valuable to us at the time. So we were very happy and went off and started writing the paper. Um, and uh, then, of course, while we were sort of halfway through that, I discovered my mistake and um, went up to my supervisor nearly in tears, explaining to him that I, I didn't think we could continue with the writing of the paper. Um, I, I have to be honest and say that I that took me a while to get to that moment. And I also definitely considered not saying anything and just maybe letting the publication go ahead. But uh, I'm glad I did say something. And my supervisor reacted in the best possible way, which was to say, don't worry, you're you're going you're gonna be fine. This is what happens, and we'll just do the analysis again um in the way that we should, which then resulted in no result. Um after that, I never used SPSS again. I didn't want to anymore. I I decided I should use uh, some sort of coding language. Um, and I used R mostly in my um, in my research and some MATLAB for doing um, uh, simulations of uh, behavioral experiments. Um, and these simulations would uh, output uh, parameters that reflected elements of behavior um, in these uh, people that we um, that were our experiment participants. Um, so I thought coding would solve all my problems uh, related to uh, faulty data input, but uh, one time we uh, got a result that again absolutely perfectly distinguished old people from young people, but really in the sense that the parameter for old people was zero and the parameter for young people was one, kind of you know the most perfect prediction of age that we could get in behavior. Um, which then also turned out to result from the reading of a faulty column in my data sheet. Um, so this is just to say that maybe programming is not the solution to everything, although good programming maybe. So if I had known about unit testing at the time and other uh, kinds of uh, ways to prevent this, I probably would have. But I also just want to point out that my supervisor in both situations reacted in the best possible way, which is to acknowledge the mistake and uh, move on and not make me feel too bad about it, because I think there's already enough pressure on uh, PhD students. So yeah, that's my, my story. Right. Thank you to all the panel for those brilliant confessions.
So at this point, I do want to, does anyone in the audience have any additional confessions that they would like to make in public? We have one volunteer up here. So if you could come down to the front or I can give you the microphone. Okay, hello. Um, my name is Nathan. Uh, I am I am an RSC uh, at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, and I now get paid to write Python programs. But of course, this wasn't always the case. Um, <laughs> I recently graduated from my PhD, uh, which I started in 2018, uh, and I had come from mostly C++. As my background, I didn't really know much about Python um, or NumPy or any of this. Um, and the first thing that I did as part of my like PhD education was I did a statistics course from astrophysics, and one of our like first things was, oh, you know, here's a Jupyter notebook, uh, and you know, you're going to calculate, you know, this like summary statistic based on this like astro data that's like, you know. It's an umpire array of like 100,000 entries or something. Um, and I didn't really get the whole vectorization thing. I Googled it a bunch of times. I looked at numpy.vectorize and I was like, this doesn't make any sense. Um, and I was like, well, I'm using numpy, so everything must be fast now, right? That's great. So I, you know, iterate over my numpy array with the Python for loop, which most of you will know is probably not the fastest way to do that. Um, and I was like, uh, you know, I was running my code and, and, and it wasn't wasn't working. Um, I mean, you know, it would time out, right? Because this is going to take forever. Uh, so what I ended up doing is, um, you know, instead of rewriting this uh, using the correct code structure, what I did was I talked to my dad, who was the lead engineer uh, on a team at Virgin Money uh, and had Azure credits. I said, I said, Dad, my um, my my program, um, you know, it must just be out of memory because maybe it's like a lot of data, right? So, you know, I just need a, a virtual machine that's a bit of, you know, a little bit bigger than the one I, you know, my like my local machine. And he was like, "Don't worry, son, I have lots of Azure credits." And he gives me this ninety-six core, like five hundred gigabytes of RAM thing. And he'd be like, "It will be done in ten minutes. Just let me know when it's, you know, when it's good." And so I run my program. Um, and I, th I think it took like eight hours <laughs> to run, and I drained the Azure credits of his team. And he was like, "Are you sure you're, you know you're, that was the right code?" And I was like, "Well, you know, it ran the result and it saved an array." Uh, later, found out that I used like I was off by a minus sign or something. So I was like, "Can I do it again?" And he was like, "I don't think we, I don't think we can do that again." So, um, so yeah. Uh, long, I, I guess that what what's the what's the take home from this? Uh, <laughs> Talk to my dad if you need to share credits. <laughs> I guess, but yeah, there we go. <laughs> I think it's supposed to be don't lend your son your zero credits. <laughs> but any other volunteers? Or should we move on to questions? Oh, there's one there. Do you want to come up or do you want to bring the microphone to you? Um, hi, I'm Yasel from TU Delft in the Netherlands. And uh, my confession is from a few years back when I was working uh, developing software in a research group here in the UK. And our team was comprised of about five developers and we had like three applications. Uh, and maybe our team had some shortcomings in the, our code, but something we're really good at was in our Git workflow. So we had some branches and we had a very good procedure to where you do commit certain types of changes. And so for projects that had been running for like five years, we had like maybe seven commits in our main branch, which corresponded to the releases and everything. So then one time my, one of my colleagues left and uh, I was put in charge of uh, handling our um, continuous integration system, which we're using Team CD. And so on the first day that he left, I said like, okay, I must uh, start testing this to see if it, uh, what, what can I do? Uh, and so that I can send him an email right away if there's a question. So I started uh, doing some changes uh, on Team CD and looking at things. And it turns out that every change that I made was making a commit into our main branch. And also it was sending an email to all our developers on our team. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously I spent like five hours that afternoon. And so that resulted in many emails and many commits. Um, and yeah, but uh, luckily I, I spoke to the team and said like, okay, I messed up. Uh, now there's like all our 
uh, main branch is, uh, you know, polluted. But in the end, I think somebody worked some magic and did some, uh, uh, you know, and did what I, I did. And uh, yeah, so um, I guess the lesson I took away is don't take it too hard on yourself. Like everybody used to learn it at some point. And uh, yeah, always just make sure that you're not doing accidental commits. Yeah. <laughs> We only got the three questions so far. Some more. Yeah. Okay, so I think maybe we should switch over to um, questions on the Slido then. Uh -huh. Just move the window there. So the first one for Fliss, do you think RSC should have the knowledge to develop software and also deploy and manage servers or should we consider more targeted roles where people are responsible for different parts of the life cycle? That's a good question. Um, so I, I I would probably say it depends on the RSA. <laughs> um, I think if you've got an interest in that, go for it. Um, but I'm not sure that maybe it, it should be kind of a formalized part of, of every RSE role. Um, so yeah, that's probably my, my answer to that. Does anyone else want to comment on that? I mean, I guess, um, I suppose there is kind of an expectation that we all need to be DevOps people as well. And it's just not, it doesn't hold, does it? It's, it really doesn't. Um, and, you know, some of us are good at that and some of us would prefer somebody else to do it. And actually identifying when we can hand it over to somebody else is a real skill and should be um, encouraged and prized, I think. Yeah. I think maybe at the very least we need to, give you enough training before handing you a VM and saying, here you go, go off and do whatever. Yeah. Especially when you've got root access on it and it's shared with all your tests. <laughs> You've got a question over there. Have we got a microphone we can run around for questions? Is there another microphone? Not intended, but in this setting, I would say maybe. Yeah. That one. I think we'd rather have questions via Slido, but we'll let it go for this one. probably longer than the comment I was about to make. Um, I think it's probably good to have access to somebody who is like in your team, maybe have one person who's interested in that and can share best practice and then maybe you just sort of throw it over to them when it gets a bit more DevOpsy and less Devi. Mm -hmm. um, or, you know, just make, make sure that you have somebody who knows this stuff because I think if you try to do it yourself without the expertise, then it's, it's going to be a problem. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like leading on from that, um, we don't all have the specialist security knowledge needed to to do DevOps really well, right? And that it is a specialist role. Yeah. Okay, the next one's a, a very good one. Can we get a show of thumbs up on this not exactly question from everyone? Who's done an RM minus RF dollar undeclared variable? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's less than I thought, actually. <laughs> And the, ne the next one, so is there a difference between it's okay to make mistakes versus if you can make a mistake to discover you've made a mistake, come chat. <laughs> Does the former ever lead to complacent attitudes? Anyone on the panel want to comment on that one? Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm trying to work out what the difference is in my head. I, I can I can comment on that. Um, I I think that it's okay to make mistakes is something very easy to say. Um, and I think there is a way of setting an example, showing that it's, you know, okay to come forward and talk about, talk about them, uh, by talking about the mistakes you make yourself. So, so in that sense, I think this, this panel or this session is, uh, mm. you know, setting an example for everyone, yeah. um, because you know, I think it's okay to make, make mistakes is just a very easy thing to say, but you have to mm. practice what you preach, you know? Yeah, I'd agree. And I think it's probably about management styles, isn't it, as well? It's encouraging, you know, within your team, if you do manage people, to be for people to creating a culture where people are able to come to you and say, oh, no, I wiped out the test server, um, is, is a really good thing. And thankfully, I did have a boss at the time who was more than happy to, to deal with that. Anyone else want to say anything on that? Or should we go on to the next one? No, okay. 
So the next question was, a team I used to work in had a document of digital guide stroke scout badges, including committed to trunk. I broke trunk. <laughs> a good way of accepting that these things happen. Has anyone else done anything like that? Has anyone... If you want to come and make a ribbon for your RSE badge, which says I broke trunk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's in the sponsor area upstairs next to the lunch hall. <laughs> I think maybe a good one at um, Collaborations Workshop on the badges, they have a, a set of stickers that describe sort of different technologies you've worked with, but maybe instead of different technologies, it should be different mistakes. Yeah. Okay, the next one. Some of the biggest mistakes I've made have been around doing a whole bunch of work before finding out that someone else has already written some of that code. Mm. Yeah. Anyone else done that? Anyone on the panel want to disagree with that, perhaps? Yeah. I, yeah, I feel like with my PhD, that happened. Yeah. Um, I started off with my master's project doing exactly the same kind of topic, um, the form of measurement errors, and was, I guess, just focusing my attention in a particular area in the kind of like linguistic speech field. And then when it came to doing my PhD and doing more digging, more of a literature review, I was like, ah, a whole other set of people have been interested in this. And if only I'd known this before so i think it's oh, it's almost inevitable because you can't have fingers in all the pies and you can't know everything which is why it's good to come to conferences and <laughs> hopefully meet other people and get little bits of knowledge that you file away for a rainy day but yeah i think unless you do have the most amazing google powers mm -hmm. then yeah, I think it's just an inevitability. And again, probably another thing you need to accept that we will make mistakes and you will spend time doing something then to discover someone else has done it. But then I guess at least you've got something to compare with. That was the the good outcome from my PhD that I then had some benchmarks to work against and say, oh, well, I did this and it was the same or it was better or it was different. So not always a bad thing. And if you have replicated work, it's not like you've not gone anywhere. No. It's you've learned stuff. Yeah, oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, it can always be worth spending 10 minutes Googling any problem you're given just to check no one else has solved it before you mm. go off and spend days working on it. <laughs> oh, we've got a bunch more questions. Um, so including your ML validation set in your training set, <laughs> celebrating ecstatically for weeks that you have a groundbreaking new model with near 100% accuracy, <laughs> early up and crying when running on the test set. <laughs> yep. Uh, anyone else also want to confess to doing that one? Yep. That... <laughs> there, was a, there was a really recent one like that where um, somebody had discovered that you could do sentiment analysis on, on text data sets using uh, gzip compression. Um, and just by the length of this, the compressed string, and it turns out, yeah, basically that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you look like you've just run here. I did. So the question, are we, are people's public confessions subject to survivorship bias? Are we not hearing a case where things were not recoverable, where there was not a backup or scripts could not be fixed and rerun? What can we do to make mistakes more survivable? Any of the panel want to comment on that one? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is survivorship bias. I still work in tech. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you're not you're not hearing from the people who who um, really stuffed up and then and then left. I guess. Um, I don't know, Dave, is there a <laughs> you set this thing up? <laughs> you want to comment on it, Dave? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably true. Um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there are more initiatives now around uh, making it uh, mandatory to publish your code along with scientific publications, right? So like, for example, if you publish with PLOS, you should also upload your scripts. And hopefully this will make it a little bit more um, easy for people to discover mistakes. But of course, I mean, I don't want to think about all the mistakes that no one ever confessed to because no one knew that they were being made. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there is survivorship bias here.
I guess the challenge with survivorship bias is to make to to try and reduce the um the survivorship what well, no to increase survivorship. <laughs> <laughs> The second time this week, I've said something completely opposite of what I meant. Yeah, so you know, it, it, culturally within organisations, um, like trying to encourage management styles which do increase survivorship when things go wrong, um, I guess is 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 my answer to that. I think also maybe from sort of like the mistake that you mentioned is that when something like this happens, is you then try and put procedures in place to make sure it doesn't happen again. Absolutely. So hopefully, these things at least only happen once. Mm. <laughs> learn okay. from the from the, uh, the intern and that is part of the reason we're doing this and that you know there is a website that will be filled with all these confessions so you can go and read them and hopefully not repeat them yourselves mm. so i think we've got time actually just to do the, the last question that's come up in there so <laughs> I, I got the five minute one <laughs> i got the five minute warning so we'll see how far we can get uh, i was hoping to be early for the break but um so knowing when to stop banging your head against the problem and ask for help seems to be a difficult thing to master, in my experience anyway. Any tips on the panel for when to admit you need help or do some buddy bug testing? I mean, that that's related to mine, so I guess I'll, I'll field that one first anyway. Um, it is hard, and um, I think it's something that you get better at over time with yeah. practice. Um, there's still occasions where I continue to do it, um, but those are kind of occasions where you, you're doing something very new and, and you kind of have the, I don't know, you, you, you don't want to let it go. Um, but, you know, sometimes you have to and, and you have to let it go earlier than you, you think you do. Um, that was a really wishy-washy answer, sorry. I guess some of it's the team thing mm. as well of knowing that you've got colleagues who will happily help you yeah. and that yeah. you're, I guess, yeah, not going to feel like, oh, I can't possibly go and ask them because they're going to think, oh, I'm an idiot. Why don't they mm. know that? And then again, it's kind of that coming down from the top of going, it's fine not to know everything. And we yeah. can't be expected to know everything and having that team ethos where people do want to help each other out. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's, yeah, kind of adjacent to what we're talking about with the the mistake making and confessing I, I just add to that that it's it's so nice to work in an rse team rather than as a an isolated postdoc precisely because you have colleagues around you who you can bug for that sort of stuff yeah um because i i certainly have spent weeks banging away at a problem when there was no one to ask um, and i guess if you're in that situation then the rse community is is here for you yeah should we create a Slack channel? Yeah. <laughs> I think we've got a comment in the audience. On the mic over. So do you think this is a problem with our education system? I mean, when you're in school, you're kind of expected to do your assignments by yourself. And then suddenly you're in a completely different environment where you're expected to ask people for help and people are happy to help you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yes. it, it definitely makes it harder to get over. Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm not sure we can change the school system that much, though. <laughs> it is very easy to say, oh, it's the school system's fault. We can change, we can't change the school system. But yeah, it's, I mean, you're kind of on the money. Like there's, there's a certain amount of institutionalization, which we're all, we're all kind of trying to get over. Yeah. Okay, so we're down to two minutes. Um, the, the person who's su suggesting an additional confession, I'm not sure we're going to quite manage that in two minutes. So I think we'll do the, the one last question, and then we'll have to stop at that point. So the final question then, is there too much focus on mistakes of make once, learn, and don't make again? Should we normalise it being okay to make repeated mistakes? I think it depends how many times you repeat it. <laughs> um, you know, there's probably a limit. <laughs> There are certain mistakes that you don't make more than once because people take your access rights away. <laughs> <laughs> I think there it's actually important to think about how how you can learn to prevent repeating the mistake. And I think there is it's about certain skills sometimes when it comes to coding. So um yeah, implementing tests and things like that.
Okay. If no one wants to say anything else on that one, then I think we will finish off at that point. So if everyone could give a round of applause to our panel.